So hello and welcome to our fourth and final session of the Virtual Roundtable discussion series. Uh, I'm Dr. Costantino Grasso and in my capacity as principal investigator of Virtual, which is a new funded project aiming at exploring the interconnections between fraudulent and corrupt practices in the area of taxation, I have the honor to welcome you and open the today's session entitled Institutional Corruption and Avoidance of Taxation. First of all, please allow me to thank our distinguished guests, Professor Brandon Garrett, Professor Prem Sika, and John Christensen. If I ever thought about bringing together a dream team to discuss this topic, I would have chosen exactly this one. It is a real honor to have you with us today. We'd also like to give a special thank you to the chair of the roundtable session, our special advisor, Professor Diane Ring, to all the other members of the virtual research team, Dr. Lorenzo Pasculli, Stephen Holden, and Engin Erken, and to Professor Stuart McLennan, who is Associate Professor of Tax Law at Coventry Law School. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the members of the audience who have decided to stay with us today and be part of this fascinating discussion. So I'm now delighted to offer some opening remarks and a brief introduction to the topic that will be discussed today. Over the course of the last two months, we have participated in a fantastic journey during our roundtable sessions, exploring the intimate interconnections between tax crimes and corruption. In that regard, I would like to thank most sincerely our special advisor, Professor Diane Ring, who has co-organized the event and brilliantly chaired all of our sessions. She has contributed significantly to the success of this scientific event and their commitment and guidance have been inspiring for all of us. The roundtables have allowed us to gather valuable knowledge from several jurisdictions within and outside the border of the European Union and significantly enriched our research perspectives, thanks to a marked multidisciplinary approach. From these fascinating discussions, as well as from the research activities conducted by the core research team, it has clearly emerged that the intimate interconnections between tax crimes and corruption are not restricted to the phenomenon of bribery which corresponds to the corrupt payment, receipt or solicitation of a private favor for an official action. Although the scenarios where a bribe is paid to a tax debt by a tax debtor to a representative of the tax administration or the tax police are surely relevant and deserve our full attention, it appears that they represent only a fraction of the problem and most likely not the most significant one. This is because corruption is a multifaceted and pervasive criminal phenomenon that has the power to infect every aspect of our society. And that as Kofi Annan brilliantly affirmed in the foreword of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, undermines democracy and the rule of law, leads to violations of human rights, distorts markets and erodes the quality of life. Unfortunately, both at the national and international level, we have constantly experienced a general reluctance to expand the legal notion of corruption, so to allow it to encompass, for instance, unethical practices aimed at unduly influencing the political process or the way in which the public administration operates. As Professor Peter Aldridge emphasized in his article focus on the adoption of the UK Bribery Act 2010, which is one of the most advanced piece of legislation in the area of anti-corruption, the legislature lost a crucial opportunity where it decided not to criminalize three main forms of corruption, which have never been criminal under English law, nepotism, asynchronous exchanges, and unreciprocated but corrupt doing of favors. The area of taxation appears particularly vulnerable to such forms of insidious interference. And this is surely not surprising because of the wealth and power of the players that may profit from them. Such an overemphasis on bribery is unfortunately an ongoing trend. In the 2018 report, jointly drafted by the OECD and the World Bank and focus on the cooperation between tax authorities and anti-corruption authorities. It is expressly acknowledged that although tax crimes and corruption are commonly viewed as distinct crimes, they are often intrinsically linked. However, the report still focuses on a notion of corruption that has been constrained to direct bribes paid to tax officials. It appears that this limited view not only fails to look at the wider picture, 
but naturally diverse the attention from the unethical and potentially legal practices perpetrated in the most developed countries where the occurrences of payment of direct bribes are much less common. If we take into consideration that recent studies, such as the ones behind the Corporate Tax Haven Index, developed by our impact partner Tax Justice Network, show how the world's greatest enablers of corporate tax abuses are located in the global north rather than in, in the global south, it clearly emerged how such a limited approach raises serious doubts as to its suitability to address the burning issue of the interconnections between tax crimes and corruption. As a result, at Virtue, we have decided to explore these interconnections, adopting a broader approach and taking into consideration how conflicts of interest may generate corrupt practices that adversely affect the taxation system as a whole. In that regard, we have identified the three different dimensions that emerge as relevant for our research. At the higher level, we could include the harmful practices adopted by nation states competing against each other, true preferential tax regimes, or sweetheart deals. Here, the main question seems to be, to what extent such questionable choices are the result of a legitimate political decision rather than of what Joel Bakken brilliantly defined as the pathological pursuit of corporate profit and power. Turning our attention to the national level, the most relevant questions here seems to be how unethical lobbying practices and the role of corporate power in politics may distort the decision-making process in our democracies, and in particular, adversely affect the era of anti-tax evasion. This is a burning issue that appears to be largely neglected by jurists. However, sociologists, criminologists, representatives of the civil society and politicians are increasingly turning their attention to it. And this demonstrates the crucial importance of a multidisciplinary approach to the matter. In that regard, the words written by Sheldon Whitehouse, the United States Senator for Rhode Island in his book, Captured of 2017, appear emblematic. Corporation of vast wealth and remorseless staying power have moved into our politics to seize for themselves advantages that can be seized only by control over government. In our analysis, we have identified several potential consequences of such an undue influence on the political decision-making process that deserve to be thoroughly investigated. The adoption of a necessary level of complexity in regulation, the practice of limiting the scope of the criminalization of illicit conducts to evident fraudulent tax evasion practices, keeping out unethical and aggressive tax avoidance ones, the continued reluctance to adopt effective transparency regimes, the adoption of legal instruments favorable to tax evaders, such as tax amnesties and negotiated resolution. It was only a few days ago that Professor Sika highlighted that during the, a debate at the House of Lords how a culture of cover-up which appears deeply institutionalized in the United Kingdom has emboldened banks and fostered the perpetration of economic crime. Finally, corruption may adversely affect the nationally anti-evasion practices, even where adequate regulations are present. These appear to be the most subtle, obscure, and underestimated effects of the interconnections between tax crimes and corrupt practices. Their consequences may consist in direct attempts to frustrate the enforcement of anti-tax evasion rules, for instance, limiting the resources, independence, competence, and powers of the enforcement authorities or agencies, or in backroom deals based on conflicts of interest generated by the economic and social interdependence of the members of the ruling elite, which are amplified and sustained through revolving door practices and asymmetric exchange of favors. At which we are perfectly aware of the significant challenges that the adoption of a notion of corruption will be broad enough to encompass all the unethical practices I've mentioned so far poses from both a methodological and a practical perspective. 
but we are also aware that only adopting such an approach, we call the explore accurate practices, actually interfere with the adoption of and implementation of anti-tax evasion strategies. Our research has highlighted the inherent risks of adopting an approach based on legal positivism and the formal conception of the rule of law. Where a government underfunds or does not grant sufficient independency or powers to an anti-corruption authority in order to thwarts its investigative powers or frustrate its efforts to fight corruption, such a decision appears to go beyond a mere political choice. This especially where we take into consideration that, quoting Professor Garrett, a corporate prosecution is a battle between David and Goliath, where prosecutors may well play the role of David. When decisions like that are taken, it is possible to argue that they represent a distortion of our democratic system in that they violate the basic values of fairness, justice, and equality that should characterize our societies. These are basic values that appear to be the most adequate external limits that can be used to safeguard our democracies against fraudulent and corrupt practices in the art of taxation. We are conscious that this research approach potentially raises more questions than it answers, but at the same time, we are aware of the crucial importance of identifying and asking the right questions, especially the ones that are rarely asked, and to try to reflect on what the possible solutions to such burning issue could be. We are also aware of the challenges related to competitive disadvantage that a virtuous state may face where a firmer approach to corporate punishment is adopted. Everybody agrees that the best solution in the area of corporate taxation should be adopted at the global level. But we also know that in an era of class of civilizations, reaching such a consensus remains a chimera. In such a scenario, the presence of a supranational check and of supranational institutions that are inherently more resistant to new influences and may watch over the application of the rule of law appears to be of crucial importance. The work of the European Union Parliament, which has recently adopted the Directive of Whistleblower Protection and of the European Anti-Fraud Office, which has funded this very project, are emblematic of that. For all these reasons, we look forward to hearing what promises to be a fascinating discussion focuses institutional corruption and avoidance of taxation. So I'm now delighted to give the floor to a special advisor, Professor Diane Ring, who is Associate Dean of Faculty, Professor of Law and Dr. Thomas Carney, Distinguished Scholar at Boston College Law. She will be the chair of our roundtable session. Diane, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, we are eager uh, to get started. Um, what I thought I would do first is uh, just do a little bit more of an introduction of our panel because we are so excited uh, to have them with us and then uh, provide just a little bit of an outline of the plan for this session. Um, so uh, we have, as Costa mentioned with us, Brandon Garrett, the L. Neal Williams Professor of Law at Duke University School of Law and he's also the director of the Wilson Center for Science and Justice. We're then delighted to have also Prem Nath Sika, member of the United Kingdom House of Lords, also Emeritus Professor of Accounting at the University of Essex. And John Christensen, director and founder of the Global Tax Justice Network, I think we're all very familiar with, uh, and also a virtue impact scholar and partner. Okay. Um, so, that, that's our round table. As Costa said, we are just uh, thrilled to get started on this. Um, what we're gonna do is have the round table session run for about 40 minutes. Um, after that, we'll close that portion down and open it up to questions uh, from the attendees. And what I encourage you to do, if you are listening and you have a question, write it in the chat and let us know. Um, that way, Costa can keep a cue uh, and have a sense of the questions as, as they're sort of coming in. When we actually get to the Q&A portion, um, what we'll do is we will turn off the recording when we ask you to ask your question. So you asking your question will not be recorded. Then we'll turn the recording back on. I will summarize your question very succinctly and we'll move right into a discussion of that question. We'll have the Q&A for about 30 minutes. Um, and then we're gonna turn it over for the summation to Engen Erkin, uh, 
uh, and that will close out our final and fourth round table. All right, so, uh, you know, Costa provided, I thought was a nice sort of roadmap for how to organize uh, our discussion a little bit. There's so much there. Um, and so I thought maybe we would actually start kind of at the top in the sense of the global level. Um, and just briefly, I don't think this will be the bulk of our conversation, but briefly um, speak to state to state level corruption, sort of where we see these kinds of issues. And I sometimes use the phrase corrupting, you know, corrupting activities, corrupting forces, again, to sort of try to signal that corruption is something quite a bit broader than generally understood. So I think my first question to all of you would be, um, if you have any sort of comments, examples on um, where we see this kind of force um, at the state to state, the international level. And I open it up, whoever would like to jump in. Well, uh, I'd be very happy to jump in if I may. Um, first of all, thanks for the introduction um, uh, and Costa for this very broad, wide ranging uh, discussion about, I, I use the term corrupt practices, by the way, Diane, because I think that there are so many um, practices that we need to identify as corrupting. At the highest level, internationally, I think one of the most corrupting um, issues um, that we, we, we face is the way in which the, the really powerful players, particularly in the world of financial services, and I'm talking here particularly about the United Kingdom and the United States, which dominate the financial secrecy index um, in particular, um, they are part of the rule pr rule making process, and that rule making in the area of taxation and corporate behaviour is is um, has been handed over to the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is of course the think tank of the rich countries. They set the rules, and it's there, and it's no surprise to anybody, I think, to know that the rules a don't work but particularly they don't work in the interest of the global South because they were gear, always geared to the interests of what are called the capital exporting countries. And that is an example of the highest level of, of, of corruption, the ability to set rules which favor some parties. Interestingly, in this case, parties of the, the, the most powerful countries in the world. But I'd like to add another dimension to this geography of corruption. And that dimension, relates to this this whole idea that nation states should compete with one another or against one another to attract capital you know at the core of globalization and financial market de deregulation and liberalization was this idea that nation states should compete against one another to attack attract capital and the nature of that cap that uh, competition takes the form of deregulation and detaxing and, and, and tax incentives. This is an, an incredibly corrupting idea in itself because it corrupts the very idea of democracy and the ability of a nation state to establish its own tax systems and its own regulatory and, and to protect its own citizens from financial market deregulation. So I think the, the, the core of this idea of nation state competitiveness and nation states competing one against the other is, 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 has completely corrupted uh, uh, the, the, the way in which uh, global trade and investment happens. So there's a, a starter. It's also helpful to focus more narrowly on anti-corruption law and legal rules surrounding payment of bribes to government officials in order to, for a corporation or someone else to extract uh, benefits in the market. And, and then in terms of tax crimes, um, you know, non-payment of taxes, sheltering assets from taxes, um, often money laundering offenses, if we're just looking at types of uh, financial crimes are associated with both, since if money is going to places illegally, um, it, there may be violations of uh, rules surrounding transfer of money between countries. And so anytime there's sort of a dark money problem, there may be uh, bribe payments, there may be avoidance of taxes, and there may be money laundering issues. And all three of those are sort of separate families of criminal offenses in many countries. Although many countries, for example, did not um, 
have foreign bribery crimes until the OECD stepped in and until the, the mid 90s, you know, it wasn't necessarily considered corrupt because many countries permitted, it was tax deductible to pay bribes in other countries. There may have been a domestic bribery prohibition, but not a foreign bribery prohibition. Uh, that has very much changed over the past couple of decades. And it's, um, more countries now do prohibit bribing agents in other countries. Um, but again, tracking where corporate money goes involves regulation and compliance in a lot of systems. And if money's going to places illegally, there may be money laundering, there may be uh, non-payment of taxes, and there may be uh, bribery components to it. Uh, in terms of interactions between countries, I mean, this, the whole anti-foreign bribery regime began out of treaties between nations and, and the OACD. Um, certainly, although, for example, in the US, we had anti-foreign bribery criminal laws in place post Watergate since the 1970s, but they weren't enforced against corporations until other countries signed on to these treaties. And it sort of seemed fair to US prosecutors to hold another country accountable when they also had a law prohibiting foreign bribery. And so, you know, you didn't have cases like the Siemens case in Germany until Germany also passed a law prohibiting it in the 1980s and 90s when Siemens could report its foreign bribes on its books that wasn't considered a criminal in Germany and US prosecutors had a harder time deciding to hold them accountable for crimes in the US that were inconsistent with, with national law in Germany. Um, one concern though, across borders in the area of tax crimes is that you know, certainly different countries can have different tax rules that can have different criteria for who pays taxes and how much, and that's fine, that's, that's national level law. Uh, but if a country is facilitating tax avoidance and tax non-payment in other countries, that all of a sudden creates a direct conflict between nations. And I think there's no better example of that than in the conflict between the United States and Switzerland, where United States and Swiss law directly conflicted and Swiss banks had long been promoting tax fraud and concealing income from the United States authorities Ultimately, that resulted in the prosecutions of 80 plus Swiss banks and an entire program for settling those prosecutions. And we can talk more about how enforcement actually works in these areas. But I think that's, that's a wonderful example of just outright conflict between the United States and Swiss law, which was ultimately resolved through uh, some diplomacy and some criminal prosecutions. Well, maybe I'll uh, uh, step in. Well, well, thank you very much for organizing this event and it's uh, really great to be here. I suppose we can look at the issues about corruption bribery at a structural level as well as the individual level. But first, I think we have a deep structural problem, which is that what we call bribery, corrupt practices, in a sense, are incubated at home, at school, at universities, in the workplace, where we, where we sort of encourage young children onwards, people to become intoxicated with private accumulation of wealth, material goods. I got 10 toys and you only got one. Ain't I a better child kind of thing? Uh, and that kind of continues. Young, young, young adults come to university all full of ideas about improving life. They all want to see their parents and grandparents with a good health care, clean air to breathe, clean water, affordable housing, decent pension, clean streets. Uh, they come to the business school and by the time they leave, all that's been driven out of their heads and it's all about maximizing shareholder wealth. And uh, practically almost all of financial reporting is devoted to reporting to speculators, they call them shareholders, uh, they're, 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 the shareholding duration in the listed companies is so short that effectively what people are serving is really the interests of speculators. And indeed, in the last decade or so, if you look at big capital markets like the UK and US, you will find hardly any new finance is raised. Uh, and even when it is raised, it is far less than uh, what has been extracted through companies in dividends and share buybacks. So the stock market is, is essentially a wealth extractor, and that is what we have the whole world of universities devoted to serving. So, so, so that is a problem. At the structural level, people, uh, some colleagues here just now, 
talked about uh, how money slushes around, but it slushes around in many different ways. You only have to look at the register of interests of the legislators of the UK House of Commons, House of Lords, and in other countries, and you will see how many legislators are on the payroll of big corporations, and often be often you know bidding for them, speaking for them. Anything else is simply driven out. Uh, so, so we have a whole problem with our legislative system, and I think what we call a uh, corruption bureau bureaucracy, a uh, corruption and bribery is in a sense written into this. And we often don't really know much about what goes on. So corporations affect the lives of people more than perhaps anything else these days, but there is no freedom of information law, which enables me to learn what corporations are doing to me. I don't even know what they put into various products, food, drink, medicine, which I actually take. So they're actually controlling our lives in many ways and we are often struggling in terms of trying to get some kind of accountability. Uh, tax havens were mentioned, just a brief comment. The feeling is that um, the states or governments must hit back against tax havens, but actually we have a very peculiar case in Britain where the government is actually building up tax havens. A good example, if I give you from last week or two, is that we have a financial services bill going through Parliament, which has a section dealing with Gibraltar. Now, Gibraltar is uh, listed in the top 30 of the corporate uh, tax haven abusers published by Tax Justice Network uh, this week. So what is the UK government proposing? That any company based in Gibraltar can sell any kind of a financial service in the UK. Gibraltar companies already account for about 20% of the UK motor insurance market, at least. Uh, so, so what the government proposals mean is that a company, which may well be just a post box in Gibraltar, can sell insurance and other financial services in the UK. The customers are in the UK, profits are in the UK, the sales are in the UK, but uh, sales and profits would be booked in Gibraltar. And Gibraltar law is that if a company makes profits in other countries, well, they can be booked there, but they are not liable to any tax. So there you have it. Uh, the, the government is actually facilitating profit shifting and expansion of, uh, uh, of, of tax havens. Why is it doing that? Because big financial services company want it. So some of us asked in parliament, could the government tell us what is the size of this profit shifting? How much tax revenue would, would the UK really lose? And the answer is there is no assessment and the government simply brushes aside these things because there is, as I said earlier, really an inbuilt lobby uh, which sort of uh, is calling for these things and they just get it. So party political donations, jobs for legislators, consultancies are buying this. And I think that is a much, much bigger problem uh, than many people actually realize. Uh, so so I'll, I'll give some more examples later on. That really sort of, I think, brings us nicely into sort of, uh, I mean, there we could, there's so much to discuss at every level, but I think that really does bring us to the sort of the state level and, and uh, the broadly um, sort of framed question of lobbying and influence and sort of what that looks like and the different forms it takes, um, you know, what are the implications? So, you know, if, if any of you would like to speak to, you know, sort of these issues, it's, you know, thinking about the lobbying, thinking about regulatory capture, where do we see that happening? How is that happening? Um, I open it to you all. Should I start again? Oh, okay, I'll, I'll just say it, say, say, say it briefly. I think, I, I think, it, I mean, lobbying is important, but to my mind, a bigger issue should be the cognitive capture, the psychological standardizing of the key policy makers. So, so they effectively bum, become like sort of puppets that don't have be, they don't actually have to be asked to do anything. They just serve their master's interest. So, so I would say that that, that is actually an issue. And then uh, people are sold all kind of tales. 
and they are persuaded to believe them. So let me just give you one example. I've been an accountant for most of my working life. Now, everybody is told we have an independent audit of companies. I can't think of even one example ever where a company has had an independent audit, which is supposed to be a bulwark against corrupt practices, supposed to be facilitating public accountability. So what happens? Uh, company directors uh, engage, uh, invite tenders for audit, which is a kind of a, a beauty parade. And there is no way an auditor would be hired if somebody comes in with a pitch to say, by the way, I find your financial reporting practices and transparency practices unacceptable. I'm really going to impose a new tougher standard. And how about hiring me? There is no way. So, so, so auditors are not hired on that basis. Even worse, so companies hire and pay the auditors. And so auditors, you know, some people say are watchdogs, and I always say they are really puppies and lap dogs. They've never really been watchdogs. And, uh, and then we find there is virtually no public revelation about how many hours the auditors spend on the job, what was the composition of the audit team, what key questions they asked, what is in the tender. And it is only through scandals such as BHS, where I was an advisor to a parliamentary committee, we learned that Price Waterhouse, who were auditing uh, BHS, uh, 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 had prepared a time budget, and that time budget included only two hours to be spent on the job by the audit partner. And the audit team was under the control of somebody with only one year's post-qualification experience, but none of that is ever revealed. So, so I'm just sort of giving examples of how we have fraudulent structures, which actually are supposed to comfort people, but actually when you scratch the surface, th there is no substance to them. To me, that itself is a big part of the corrupt corruption that is all around us. And we need to talk about it and explode it and, and facilitate emancipatory and significant change. I think another example of that was in the, uh, it's in a way a UK example, but it's in a US and global example is in the case of HSBC, where regulators in the US, including the controller currency, uh, basically their auditing surrounding money laundering issues consisted of paper auditing, where they would look to see whether you know, an international bank had, had a compliance division that was tasked to look at money laundering stuff. Uh, but they didn't actually review any of the records. They didn't review suspicious activity reports or any of the documentation that was produced by a bank. And therefore, you know, money laundering was going on and sanctions violations and several other financial crimes were going on at a grand scale across HSBC's operations really all around the world. It was a hornet's nest of money going to all the wrong places in the world. And, you know, when there was a congressional inquiry in the US, they kept asking, well, where were the regulators? And they looked at kind of the, the paper procedures and didn't actually audit. Uh, but talking about the question of capture, you know, it wasn't an accident that many of these key regulators were defanged or ineffectual. Uh, it's been a longstanding fact and scandal of US politics that they were, or our topic is tax crimes and tax fraud and tax corruption, you know, the Internal Revenue Service in the United States has been, you know, horribly deprived of even minimal resources to, to do enforcement. Uh, and so, you know, we have a many hundreds of billions of dollar per year tax gap, as they call it in the US, uh, something like $400 billion a year, just an enormous amount of money. Uh, and, and the IRS, you know, has proclaimed year after year that, look, we can't really meaningfully audit um, you know, seriously wealthy individuals who don't even, even ones who don't file tax returns, um, just egregious tax non-compliance cannot meaningfully be investigated. It's much easier to investigate someone who is fairly poor and doesn't attach or require a document or something like that, but to actually audit complex behavior by wealthy individuals and corporations, the Internal Revenue System Service really doesn't have the enforcement resources to do it. And they don't. Um, when you look at the stories of some of these major corruption related corporate prosecutions, you know, as, as ineffectual as the Internal Revenue Service is in the United States, 
a lot of the big global corporate corruption cases have been brought by prosecutors in the United States because the Department of Justice in the United States has a lot of resources and they have some FBI agents and they bring global investigations. And it's somewhat of an embarrassment that so many of the most important cases that involve a lot of conduct that's outside the United States are brought by United States prosecutors. And even some of the countries that have passed anti-corruption legislation, it's often been because it's been embarrassing that the German companies or the French companies have paid so many billion dollars in fines to United States prosecutors. They would rather some of those fines be paid to their domestic prosecutors. Uh, but you know, even if uh, for better or for worse, the United States is often the, the global enforcer uh, in anti-corruption cases brought against corporations, enforcement resources are really, really lacking in the United States and we're the standard bearers. And so that, that, that bodes quite poorly for efforts to you know, enhance EU standards and other standards in the world where just so many of these countries have provisions on the books, but no meaningful enforcement apparatus. Brandon, if I may, first of all, thanks for bringing up the example of HSBC, which is one of my uh, real bet noirs. Um, I, I made a film called um, HSBC, The Gangsters of Finance. One of the things that absolutely appalled me about the investigation of HSBC's money laundering activities in the United States was the fact that the British Chancellor of the Exchequer and the British Prime Minister went to Washington urgently to lobby on behalf of HSBC to prevent the DOJ from going ahead with the yeah. prosecution. Yeah, we, didn't hear about that, we didn't hear about some of that until years later. So it it yeah, did not emerge right away. This bank was too big to fail, too big to jail, uh, and whilst we're about it, too big to tax as well. So, you know, this is, you know, an appalling case of corporate capture. Um, and I think it kind of, it, it makes me think of what Prem was saying about this kind of cognitive capture, you know, the, the idea that we have to go out and fight on behalf of these criminal banks to protect them from prosecution um, is, is appalling and the corruption at the, at the highest level. Um, but it ties into what Diane was talking about in the earlier question about this kind of nation state competitiveness. And we have to go out there as, as states, our states go out to protect our national champions. And HSBC is, of course, a key champion of the British economy. So our, our politicians have to go out and champion them. Um, but it, it, Prem, what Prem said earlier about cognitive capture and, and the extent to which politicians are, and, and the media journalists and others are captured by a set of ideas reminded me of something which um, happened just ahead of the uh, great financial crisis. I was invited to speak on BBC's morning program, Radio 4 Today program, um, because Prem and I and a few others had been signaling the imminence of a financial crisis. Um, and I, I went in there and um, they, they brought in as a discussant, a, a, a lobbyist um, who said that far from there being a, a, a crisis which the state should intervene, he said that the state needs to do everything possible to protect the big, the city of London from, from uh, financial regulation and from tax in order to protect its competitiveness. And at that stage, I said, look, the, the city of London um, has a very weak compliance record, but most importantly, it has the most, it has some of the highest fee levels in the world. And for an economist, if the city of London wants to compete globally, it should compete by lowering its fees and improving the quality of its services. That's the way in which competition happens in a market economy. But it's, in other words, the banks should lower their fees, the law firm should lower their fees. And this struck the BBC presenter, I'll name him as John Humphrey, as so, uh, such an appalling and idiotic idea. He said, no, that's not the way that competition works. We have to help our companies to compete by deregulating and by not enforcing compliance. Um, well, the rest is history. A few months later, the city of London almost totally collapsed. But this cognitive capture lies at the level of economics as well. This idea that states should help companies to compete by deregulating. Mm 
and by giving them special tax treatment and by turning a blind eye to their money laundering practices in the case of, case of HSBC, frankly, is corrupting the global economy at the highest level. Um, I, I was thinking about two particular themes that have come out so far in, in, this, um, in this discussion and just a little bit of how you see that in the US play out regularly in some of the debates. Some of it's, some of it's slightly positive and, and much of it not, obviously. Um, in terms of the, the cognitive capture, uh, one of the threads of, of discussion in the US um, about digital taxes and the effort by some of the major U.S. corporations to um, put the, the digital tax problem as a sort of number one on the agenda was a way of framing it as a, a national problem, U.S. companies being targeted, um, and, and therefore bad for the U.S. And so it was very much you know, a, 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 a way of framing it, but we also saw people push back and say, hold it, you know, is this diff any different than a sales tax in that country? And you wouldn't be able to get us sort of so engaged on that and worked up. And so, you know, what's really going on versus how is it being framed and being sort of sold um, um, to the legislatures? Um, the other thing I wanted to, to just comment briefly on was complexity, because um, that had come up both in, in Costa's remarks a little bit and then, and then just now, uh, because obviously complexity starts with the legislature, starts with the drafting of laws, works into the administrative level, um, and lots of reasons obviously for it, but one of the real implications, certainly at least in the US, is who is easy to audit and who isn't, and Brandon got at this before, um, and I think partnership tax in the US again is a great example. It's an immensely complicated regime for uh, 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 quite a number of reasons, not disconnected to what taxpayers want. But as a result, it's really challenging for the, for the Internal Revenue Service to meaningfully audit, to have sufficient resources, skilled personnel, uh, to dive into what are among the most complex returns we have. And so you can just see it all weave together. Um, but some of this has already brought us to, I thought what would be just our, our sort of next focus for a, for a moment is a little bit more about the enforcement level and sort of where we see some of these forces, um, you know, play in whether we're thinking about, um, you know, settlement agreements or amnesty or, and even as Brandon mentioned earlier, sort of uh, literally constraining enforcement through constraining dollars. Right? If you don't have staff, you don't have personnel, it doesn't even matter what the law says, you won't enforce. Um, and so just to kind of speak to that for a little bit, if you'd like. I mean, that's certainly been a story in the UK where, you know, the UK bribery law was adopted and you'd think, oh, they're adopting sort of a US approach with more options, more flexibility for enforcers. Maybe they'll start bringing in a lot of major corporate cases like we've had in the US. And instead it's been kind of a trickle of a handful of cases. And there's always the concern that the serious fraud office didn't really have the wherewithal, even if there's some good people there to, to bring cases at scale. And, uh, you know, we, we've seen some of the same in other countries where they've brought a handful of cases under new anti-corruption statutes and the like. Um, often these statutes are pretty well thought out and a lot of work went into thinking about their provisions. Often there are laws that are actually much better sort of explained and set out and clear and have better processes than in the US where we have broad criminal statutes and vague Department of Justice guidelines, all sorts of problems with the US approach. And so I worry about it being exported. Um, but maybe the most important thing to export is just the enforcement resources, but maybe that's just sort of comparative U.S. wealth. And some of it's maybe one of the few upsides to a, a U.S. system where just there's a lot of money for prosecution. We're, we're the home of mass incarceration. So, you know, uh, prosecutors have, have plenty of funds. There's plenty of staff as compared with, with other government agencies. Uh, there are lots of good things about wealthy countries spending their money on things aside from prosecutors. But it does mean that in the U.S. we have seriously talented prosecutors who have financial crimes experience and the like. Uh, now, there's also uh, a lucrative side benefit, which is that you know if you have experience doing serious financial crimes cases in the U.S., that can give you really good private side employment opportunities as a lawyer. I actually see that revolving door as a really positive thing in terms of attracting really good people who want to uh, 
bring big cases against corporations. You don't have that kind of turnover or culture in enforcement offices in other countries. And there are a lot of good reasons to be worried about a revolving door, but in terms of attracting people who understand complicated financial transactions and, and will then earn a lot more money doing that in the private sector, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it would be looked at with horror in, 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 in most countries. I think for some good reason, the actual you know, people who do the work and who then make a lot of money when they leave the work in the US, people see that as corrupt. I, I see it as having some real benefits, but I do understand the concern. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll follow uh, uh, Brandon. I think uh, there will probably never be enough resources in any country to go after big corporations. Bear in mind, many a corporation has a bigger sales revenue than the GDP of many a nation as well. So I think we, in a sense, got to look for other ways to supplement whatever else we do. And one of these is to opt for transparency and openness. So we are busy fighting uh, corporations about tax avoidance. So one of the things I've argued for a long time, why not require corporations to publicly file their tax returns together with any advice they receive on that tax? That means they will have to file details publicly about all the correspondence they had with lawyers and accountants about how to dodge taxes. So, so there is a potential that that can actually turn every citizen into an auditor. Now, somebody might scoff at it and might say, look, what do ordinary people know about these things? Well, actually, they know quite a lot because these so-called technical experts have very rarely alerted the people to tax avoidance or corporate frauds or anything. Often it's been determined journalists and individuals who have sort of uh, exposed that. So that is one kind of thing. Second is, uh, I think we should also look at the way the regulatory bodies are structured. So when you look at the regulatory bodies, typically uh, uh, they are under the control of corporate grandees coming through revolving doors which swing both ways because they also go back to corporations after a stint at a regulatory body and they know who exactly to serve. And we are often told that we must get experts who have the technical know-how. And if you think about it, what does technical know-how do? It has the potential to reduce your worldviews, reduce your vision, reduce your concerns, because pretty soon you become occupied about what is technically correct. But if you strip away the word technical, ask yourself, where exactly do these techniques come from? Well, all techniques are constituted by politics and interests. There is absolutely nothing natural about them. So, so there is kind of a built-in capture into the regulatory system. And the way to breach that, and I floated an amendment in Parliament yesterday, uh, which had some support, my argument was that each regulatory body though yesterday we were only looking at the Financial Conduct Authority and the Prudential Regulatory Authority, that each regulatory body should have a supervisory board made up of stakeholders to watch over the executive boards running the regulatory bodies so that there can be a diversity of views and interests. And that would make it much, much harder for the executive boards, as it were, to continue to run with fairly narrow vision or nakedly defend the interests of the industry. So, so in other words, we could democratize the regulatory structures. I hear very little talk of that. Of course, in the US, you have had some very, very notable individuals who really gone after wrongdoing, and Robert Morgenthau comes to mind for dealing with a lot of uh, corporate frauds in the New York State, and Jack Blum, who was the advisor to uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee over the BCCI frauds. And indeed, uh, uh, and it is only after the US revelations that the Bank of England decided uh, in the UK that there was no a hiding place and they better do something, uh, they shut it down. So, so I would suggest that we really need to look at the kind of changes we can make. In other words, make it very difficult for individuals, organizations engaging in corrupt practices to hide 
and that is transparency and democracy, and also make it easier for citizens to bring a lawsuit for wrongdoing. At the moment in the UK, that is almost impossible, and you've got to be very, very rich to do it. Prem, uh, I want to take issue, I and mean, obviously uh, there will never be enough resources around to tackle all of this, but, but um, you know, if we look, for, for example, at the UK and the under-resourcing of some of the key agencies, you know, think about mm. Companies House, the registry of companies, yeah. uh, which uh, apparently it's a public, uh, a public register with, you know, but, but the information which whenever I look at Companies House, I, I realize that it's so deficient, it's so, so weak in terms of standards, it's, information is out of date or incorrect and so on. But it's not just Companies House, it's also the Financial Conduct Authority, the Serious Fraud Office. Mm -hmm. There's a, there is quite clearly a comprehensive under-resourcing of key agencies. And I do not think that that is accidental. I think it has happened as a part of a deliberate process of undermining uh, compliance or the, uh, and, and enforcement. Um, so I think that if we look at what's happened in too many, uh, particularly the tax haven ju jurisdictions, which we investigate at the Tax Justice Network, what you see is a lot of window dressing. They adopt anti-money laundering legislation onto their statute book, but they put no resource into it uh, so that any compliance and enforcement is tokenistic. But we've talked a lot about um, uh, regulatory capture, I also think that we should be looking at judicial capture as well. Um, and and yeah. here, I, and what brings this to mind is that I've been working for the last few weeks on a, a very interesting uh, leak that comes out of Jersey. Everyone knows that I'm connected with Jersey. Um, but a leak has come out of, of, of Jersey, uh, and it turns out that uh, this leak, which happened years ago, um, what, something like 350,000 legal documents came out of a, a out of a, a trust and company administration business, and were handed to the police, and the police and the attorney general and the judiciary in Jersey chose to do nothing whatsoever with it. In fact, the prosecutions that have happened around this case have happened in the United States. And then when we looked more deeply at um, uh, at, at, at this particular case, and I've got a call with a J New Zealand journalist coming up immediately after this session uh, this evening. I'm, I'm talking to a, a journalist in New Zealand about this. When we started looking at it, we found that the trust and company administration business had worked for many years with a particular law firm in Jersey called Ogier. And Ogier is one of the off so-called offshore magic circle companies. And it turns out that a senior partner of Ogier was also the head of the Jersey Police Federation at the time that the Jersey Police, <clears throat> Police Force decided to do nothing to investigate. And it turns out that the Attorney General was a senior partner also of this law firm, Ogier, and he chose to do nothing about it. And it turns out that the island's senior judge and bailiff was also a senior partner of the same law firm, Ogier, um, that was involved in so many of these, these scandals being revealed by this leak. Um, so I think that we need to slightly broaden out uh, the discussion to also consider the idea of judicial capture, because my impression is that many of the smaller offshore secrecy jurisdictions and tax havens that we investigate at the Tax Justice Network are as prone to judicial capture as they are to regulatory capture. And uh, John, I think your comments as well as, as, well as uh, those of, of Prem and Brandon, uh, we're not gonna have time to explore, but they are, they're leading to other ways of thinking about sort of relationships and revolving doors. So I was thinking of describing it as um, revolving roles. You don't actually leave, you just kind of shift what you're focused on at any one moment. You play multiple roles, you have multiple incentives, um, you know, and, and, you know, sort of what are the kinds of conflicts of interest, um, you know, and, and what you're identifying are there are just a lot of ways in which um, this plays out. And also the issue of independence, interdependence, I should say, how incentives and goals among various players can and do align. Again, 
separate from a formal revolving door, which I think of as truly, you, you are the regulator in this field, then you go back and turn out to be the advisor in the field and back and forth. That's just one sliver, right? Um, there are many other re, you know, ways in which you can have multiple relationships or interdependence. And so we won't be able to get into it all, but I just wanted to sort of lay out that I think the threads of what you all have been saying have been leading to that. Um, we have just a few minutes before I want to turn to our question and answer, but I think that will also be for a time for us to further um, explore many of these issues. But I thought we should at least just take a, a moment to speak a little bit more about where we would go. That is, and, and Prem, you've already been doing that. You outlined um, some of your prior recommendations about transparency for corporations with respect to their um, tax returns, about regulatory body structure. Um, but I just wanted to sort of give you all a, another opportunity, you know, if you had the ear of really interested citizens, a special corporation who's suddenly really taking you seriously, uh, members of your government, what would you point them towards as, as some suggestions, particularly, and I'll raise this as the counter, uh, when they will get pushed back to say, if we do these things, just within our country, just within our regulatory enforcement, uh, we will be at a competitive disadvantage. Our businesses will fail to do well. And this is a thread that we've had earlier, but I just kind of want to lay it out there. So I turn it over to you all. Well, can, can I kick that one off by, by picking up on your last comment there? Um, because for something like 30, 40 years, this, we've been listening to this, frankly, this nonsense about nation, national state competitiveness. We as a nation state compete with other nation states. No, we don't. Uh, we, we, we should be cooperating with them, particularly in trying to tackle uh, corruption. We should be co cooperating them cooperating with them in a race to the bottom, to the top, not to the bottom. We should be actually promoting better regulation and better enforcement and so on, because that will actually create better markets and better market yeah. conditions. So, so the very idea of competitiveness in this area is, 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 is an, 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 a nonsense to begin with, um, but it's, it's, it's a toxic nonsense, which also harms the, 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 the states. I, I, I take, particularly this case of, of uh, you know, UK and, and its so-called goose that lays the golden egg, which is the City of London. In order to help the City of London compete, we must deregulate, we must tax them lower, we must do everything to help them to compete. Um, that is such a, such a nonsense. It's hard to, to it, but it's a nonsense that also harms the UK economy because the City of London has turned, not, it's not a creative sector, it's an extractive sector, it's extracting wealth from not just the rest of the world, but also from the UK economy itself, it's harming the UK economy. Well, Spriggs, that won't be a problem now that there is no more economy in the City of London, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, I, I'm sure, not sure if you've seen today's trade figures, but they are disastrous, Brandon. You know, Brexit has now come into true focus. I did see. Uh, but the idea that, you know, the best thing we can do to compete globally is to deregulate, and not enforce compliance and not regulate, uh, you know, not tackle and, and enforce uh, against criminal activity is, is seriously deluded. Um, we should be doing the exact opposite. And that is the best way of helping to improve productivity, to help uh, to, to strengthen innovation and so on. But the, the very idea of nation state competitiveness, com, com, what nations competing against one another in this sphere needs to be challenged from the start. One way that um, some tricky prosecutors in the US thought about this to try to incentivize the race of the top and take advantage of companies own desire to come out ahead of their competitors it really came from, you know, Department of Justice lawyers in the US that were familiar with um, anti-mafia work and, and, you know, serious efforts to weed out corruption in mafia infiltrated, you know, industries like the garment district in New York and the like. Um, and, and, and some of that influenced the development of this anti-cartel approach in antitrust, where the idea is you incentivize what we colloquially call in the U.S. snitching or informing. And so if a company wants to, you know, companies benefit, may benefit from uh, themselves paying bribes or themselves 
fixing prices with their competitors or themselves uh, hiding money from tax authorities. Um, but if their competitors are doing it too, it's not, not so much of a competitive advantage anymore. And so how can they do better by doing clean business? Well, they only really do better by doing clean business if they turn in their competitors and know that something bad will happen to their competitors. Or even if they are continuing to do unclean business, if they get some amnesty by saying, okay, we paid bribes, but so do these other people. And well, often if they're jointly bidding on a deal or jointly using the same tax advisor, they will know very well what their competitors are doing and will have great evidence that they can share with prosecutors. And US prosecutors have really leveraged that in ways that are really clever because even you know, with comparatively more resources, like no, no federal prosecutor's office in the US really has the resources to go after all these different tax havens and tax shelters. Well, that's what they did in the Swiss banking cases. They couldn't prosecute 83 banks on their own, really. They said, you know, if you don't turn yourselves in or turn in your colleagues, it won't be good for you. And we are coming. Uh, and so using a company's own selfish motives to incentivize turncoat and snitching type behavior among largest corporations, genius, genius. And that's something that can be done to use, use corporate competitiveness and selfishness to promote clean business. Ren, did you want well, to offer a comment? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, the interesting thing is this notion of competitiveness is not used to improve the distribution of income or wealth or better rights for workers or homes for homeless uh, people. It, it is kind of a very weird, primitive, neoclassical kind of economics kind of approach. And we have had this dialogue in Parliament again this week and as and when anybody suggested uh, improvements in public accountability, uh, the response from some uh, members of parliament is, well, that will increase the cost. And I did have to point out to somebody that there's nothing more costly than status quo. Just ask somebody uh, you know, who's uh, been a victim of a financial fraud or uh, uh, been cheated in, in, in some other way. But the problem is a lot of these people who talk about these things don't make a distinction between public and private costs. They only think about the private costs and not the public costs. But the irony is, if all businesses behave, you will actually you will actually have uh, less regulatory costs. But the fact is that they don't behave. Therefore, that is why we need lots of uh, regulatory bodies and uh, structures. And I, indeed, I had a dialogue, which was not in Parliament, just online with somebody. And somebody said, we need a tax cut. And I, first of all, wonder what that means. And I, then I said, actually, you can have it. All you need to do is improve the distribution of income. Uh, and therefore, there would be less mental health problems or less problems arising out of people living in poor housing. They can all have decent food, and therefore, they will not be asking for Social Security benefits. So how about it? Improving the distribution of income. I'm afraid uh, I didn't get anywhere. I didn't expect to. But in other, in other words, there's a, there's a very different perspective on how you can reduce, reduce some regulatory costs. But that is not what they were willing to do. But I think what John and Brandon were saying, in a sense, what we are up against is rampant corporate power. So corporations, as we uh, you know, dominate every part of our life, but they also are creating diseases, whether they are related to tobacco, thalidomide, obesity, adulterated food, and they're simply not held accountable for it at all. Shareholders sit back, receive dividends, run from one company to another. Those dividends may well come out of uh, unethical and even illegal practices, which bring death and destruction to many. But shareholders can't be touched. They are utterly immune from this. So again, we have to look at the very model of corporation, which itself encourages uh, 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 the kind of practices which we are uh, unhappy about. And we need to look for alternatives to, co to corporations. Even where we have corporations, we should be democratizing them. And that's why I mentioned right at the beginning, is there any reason why giant corporations should not be subjected to freedom of information laws? After all, they are experimenting every day on all of us. Don't we have a right to know what they are doing to us? 
and it is hard to find politicians who would actually subscribe to that. But of course, if I get a chance, I will raise that kind of thing in British Parliament. I'm sure it will go down like a lead balloon, but some things are worth floating and I will try to do that. Thank you. Um, I uh, will have to close out this part right now, but uh, as I said, I know that the Q&A will provide um, again, more opportunity to, to flesh out these issues. Uh, so as we go to the Q&A, let me just um, uh, make three points about how we'll proceed. So I have a list of people um, and I will uh, say your name. And then when it's your turn, uh, we will turn off the recording when you ask your question, so you won't be recorded. I will ask you to state your name and your affiliation. And also if you're part of the Virtue Project, uh, and then you can ask your question. Once you're done, we'll turn the recording back on. I will quickly restate that very, very briefly. Uh, and then we will open it up for comments um, from our panelists kind of in response. You know, we don't have to, you know, not everyone has to answer everything. I know we have quite a number of questions. We'll try to at least get through them a bit. Um, so I think we're ready to begin. Um, so we've just had a question regarding the new UK uh, Investigatory Act, that's my quick summary as a, a non-UK person, uh, that provides immunity uh, for those who've been otherwise pre-authorized uh, to work in behalf of pursue uh, the various interests of the UK government or the UK, including um, economic well-being of the country. And the question is whether or not that kind of very broad immunity will in fact uh, lead individuals with that kind of protection to effectively um, squash efforts at others to challenge tax avoidance, uh, to challenge corruption, perhaps to destroy documents, all in pursuit of economic well-being. I start, maybe? Well, uh, thank you, Stephen. It's a very interesting question. In my view, the covert <coughs> human intelligence sources bill is the worst kind of legislation which anybody could ever develop. Just to give a brief uh, background, <coughs> the basically the UK law for the last 200 years has been that a state official may do something, whatever they think is in the public interest. Let's just think about an extreme example. Uh, say a policeman finds an armed terrorist on London Bridge, on the spur of the moment has to take action. There is no time to consult anybody, shoots the terrorist, now what do you do? Well, the, the position is, well, you then have a hearing, you take the evidence, you examine the circumstances, and then you decide whether the action was appropriate. But all that is being actually overturned. So under the CHIS bill, as it is called, uh, there can be state or non-state actors of any age who can be authorized to commit, that is, they're authorized in advance to cr commit criminal acts, whether it is murder, rape, torture, nothing is barred. They can be authorized as long as that is in, uh, the, there is a clause in the bill off the top of my head, I think it is clause five, which uh, says as long as that is in the interest, uh, that is in the UK economic interest and also in the national security interest. So if you happen to be an innocent victim of this premeditated act, there is no restitution because it's already authorized. There is no, no, nobody will be telling you that it is authorized other than some key individuals within the organizations and possibly ministers who would know about this. So freedom of information law would not secure that information for you. Even though I, I have always argued we never really had freedom of information law in the UK, at best, we only had a possible right of access to information because we don't really know what information is actually held. We don't have a list, so we can only guess what may be there and ask about this. Now, the government's argument is that this is really vital. Now, I was not convinced in any parliamentary debate that that was vital, and I voted against the act. I also voted for 
a number of amendments which were tabled to protect the innocent victims, but the government rejected them. So basically, it is a huge erosion. I mean, you will feel this in your everyday life. Your phone can be tapped without any court order. A person can come to your door, has the appropriate ID, and says, I want to search your premises. If you say no, you are committing a criminal offence. Uh, so these operators don't actually need a court order to do these things to you. This is a huge erosion of people's, uh, of people's civil rights, threat to human rights. The, of course, many other governments, many other countries are also facing similar kind of concerns about security threats and issues about uh, well-being. For example, you can look at Canada, U.S., they don't have a similar kind of law. So the UK is actually charting a completely new territory. And that is very, very dangerous. Will it really help to deal with corrupt practices? Well, that was one of the things the government argued, that they need to send in undercover agents. Well, do they really need to commit murder, torture, rape, and other, uh, and other things in order to uncover corruption? Or do we need some other approaches, like I talked about some examples I gave earlier? So I think it is a moment of profound danger to the rights that we may enjoy and already enjoy some of them. Stephen, if I could just add to what Prem said, I, I agree with everything that Prem said. Speaking now on, from a civil society perspective, uh, as chair of Sachs Justice Network, but also as someone who works a lot with investigative journalists, it's. Um, it, it concerns me enormously that we will not have access. We will not know what state agencies are doing. We cannot ask questions about what state agencies are doing, uh, apparently on the public behalf. Uh, it, it, it concerns me also more broadly that uh, uh, in the UK, and I'm sure this is happening elsewhere, uh, there is a deterioration of the conditions within which uh, civil society can operate, a climate of uh, a, a climate where uh, apparently um, it, to, to combat this greater accountability and transparency, uh, NGOs are finding themselves increasingly under pressure to not ta not ask awkward questions. Uh, to, and this has reached the stage where we at Tax Justice Network are having to very seriously consider the idea of relocating our corporate registration out of the UK because we are concerned that um, increasingly the, 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 the uh, boundaries within which we can operate are being quite carefully trimmed to... to uh, to, to reduce the space within which we can operate. And I see this law as potentially one part of that, reducing the space within which civil society and journalists can operate. Thank you. Um, so now our recording will go off. And so I'll, I'll just restate the question for our recording. Um, so as we think about the relationship between the global South and the global North, uh, with sort of attention to the, the fact that the global south uh, faces um, issues with a lack of capacity, um, but we find flows going to the global north to find, you know, financial flows, finding a safe haven. Uh, given regulatory capture, how do we sort of move forward on that? So um, open it up to you too. If I can uh, begin, because uh... I, I, I like optimism and <coughs> certainly we at Tax Justice Network always like to come forward with solutions, but these are very much green shoots. Um, I think um, I'd point you in, in the direction, um, Aviola, of uh, an organization called Tax Inspectors Without Borders, um, which is a, 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 a joint UNDP OECD project. Um, but if you dig deep, you'll find it originates from Tax Justice Network. It came out of a proposal I put to a uh, government summit meeting in 2011 to build capacity for tax authorities and enforcement agencies in the global south by sharing 
best practice uh, and by um, by bringing in very often on a south south cooperation uh, basis really um, highly experienced tax inspectors tax uh, specialists uh, and, and 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 tax investigators to work with tax authorities across the global south if you look at their website you find that by and large this has been a, a an enormous success story not just in terms of helping global south countries to raise additional revenue but also and and to build their tax tax enforcement capacity but also in pushing back against the very corrupted corporate culture which for many decades has just kind of assumed that the tax authorities are going to be so weak that they can't handle transfer mispricing uh, and other complex tax avoidance uh, matters um, and that 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 culture is changing fast uh, but i'd like to see this kind of um, cooperation international cooperation extended to also strengthen judicial authorities and enforcement authorities um, because i think that there, there are weaknesses there as well not just in the tax area but in anti-money laundering areas and so on but i think uh, there, uh, there's a green shoot there and another green shoot i'd like to point out is the united nations facty panel has just this month, I'm well, sorry, last month actually, um, uh, kind of ag agreed a whole program of reforms, which I think will will in the course of the coming decade massively strengthen transparency arrangements, cooperation arrangements, and will I hope lead to a rewriting of the international rules for taxing multinational companies which i hope will curtail a great deal of uh, tax avoidance by powerful uh, multinationals okay i'll i'll, I'll step in there uh, th thank thank you for a very interesting question and like john i'm always optimistic and i think civil society organizations as tax justice network has demonstrated and can do quite a lot and indeed it has been a, a pivotal movement in sensitizing people to the issues about tax avoidance tax evasion tax havens and putting forward ideas or reforms some of which are now being accepted as though they are commonsensical things to do by the powers to be so, so, so that is very important. I think Global South also needs to join forces and develop the, and, and develop their common interests. In relation to tax, the, the weaknesses of the transfer pricing rules have often been highlighted by countries like India, Brazil, South Africa, which in a sense is forcing the OECD to rethink uh, some of uh, those issues. I, as an accountant, I'm always uh, troubled by why Global South wants to use Western accounting ideas. Uh, so when, when Western companies prepare financial statements, as I said earlier, they're primarily aimed at speculators in capital markets. But when you go to many developing countries, firstly, thankfully, you don't have such deep capital markets. Lots of businesses are kind of family controlled. And you also have lots of other problems around employment, encouraging investment in R&D, public uh, uh, investment in productive assets, and so on. There is no accounting rule in the Western world which promotes it. <laughs> so I've always argued, whenever I've spoken to any conference from uh, Africa, Asia, I've encouraged them to get together and develop their own accounting standards. Which, which give visibility to local problems and deal with them. Rather than saying, here is an, what happens in the Western world, we have what they call international financial reporting standards. They are issued by an uh, international accounting standards board, which is a subsidiary, if you like, of the IFRS Foundation, which is registered in Delaware. And the sole reason for being in Delaware is so that it can avoid taxes on all corporate contributions and other revenues that it generates. 
that's a hell of a credential for an organization supposed to be pushing boundaries of corporate uh, accountability. So my encouragement would be really for these countries to get together. They do have a lot in common and form common alliances and do what is good for the people in their own countries. Great. Um, our next question uh, comes from someone who is having um, a little bit of an audio uh, difficulty. So I'm going to read the question. All right. Uh, and it regards the exchange of favors and interdependence of members of the elite uh, in academia, in the judicial sector, in the corporate sector, in the political environment. So just to sort of comment really on sort of what that sort of network of, and a little bit of the interdependence that we mentioned before, um, how that figures in to what we're seeing. Well, Prem, I was expecting you to kick off, but maybe, <laughs> maybe I will. I mean, oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off. I think I think there are certainly major issues here. I there was a journalist who worked for a major UK newspaper, uh, Daily Telegraph, the Telegraph, and he actually resigned uh, because he was constantly told not to run any stories, negative stories about HSBC, because HSBC advertised a lot, and the newspaper was not really very keen on the losing possibly that advertising account. There are lots of accountancy magazines, uh, even online now, and in yesteryears they were in print. Uh, they, they are really run by uh, what some people say professional accountancy bodies, I always like to call them trade associations, which annoys them a lot and that's good. So, uh, so they were run by and owned by accountancy trade associations. They very rarely ran anything critical about big accounting firms or, 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 or the auditing industry. Their notion of criticism was on technical grounds, not on any sociological, philosophical grounds, but just on, on, on sort of te technical issues. And so that again, in a sense, shows how some of these alliances run. And it would be interesting research for someone to look at the debates for example, we've just been discussing the Financial Services Bill in Parliament. Look at the speakers and see those who are close to the finance industry, what actually they have to say. And you will find most of them busy defending, defending the indefensible. So certainly, you know, in a sense, some of these problems have been highlighted by people like Noam Chomsky and his very famous book, Manufacturing Consent, a long time ago. But you can actually observe them in, 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 in everyday discourse. And, you know, I watched over the world of accounting for a long, long time. I won't bore you with some of the details. But over the years, all kinds of concessions have been given to accounting firms which have made it much, much harder for the victims of auditor negligence to sue the audit firm. And in most cases, would you find the ministers who have given away these concessions upon leaving office end up working for those accounting firms as consultants? They're not really hired because of their accounting skills. They are hired because of their political maneuvering, getting access to uh, key policy makers, senior civil servants, and others. So, so there is a lot of that. And what I've always argued is being a legislator, especially in the House of Commons, is a full-time job. They get paid very nicely. There is no way they should be allowed to do consultancy for anybody else. And often the response is, yeah, but I need to talk to business. Otherwise, I can't contribute effectively to parliament. My response is, please, by all means, talk. Any money you, you collect, let us create a new foundation for democracy, and it all ends up there, uh, and uh, so that you don't personally receive a penny. And, of course, uh, they would not really be keen on that. So certainly there are those kind of networks. And I think, so. Uh, you know, I come back to my earlier message, that the state we find ourselves is, uh, in is really there because of the corrupt 
political philosophies and institutional structures that we have. They're all man-made. There is nothing natural or inevitable about them. There is no invisible hand. It is a visible hand of social interests which has created them, and therefore we can change them. All our predecessors have shown how things can be changed. We can change them too. Thanks, Prem. Can I, can I just add uh, another dimension to this? Uh, speaking now as someone who worked uh, both in the UK and in the Jersey civil service, I ran a department. Uh, I was a very senior advisor to government acting as a civil servant. It has concerned me enormously in the last few decades to watch the independence of the civil service, which has in the past attracted some really superb independent professional people. Um, watching that, that independence being eroded by the uh, that by, by the bringing in to the, to, in, at the highest level or bringing in special advisors from the big law firms, from the big accounting firms, from banks and other uh, industries, coming in and nakedly promoting the, the interests of their employers, in other words, the big four accounting firms and so on, um, with very little idea of what constitutes a public interest and absolutely no interest in promoting public interest um, and it's, it has concerned me enormously also to see the extent to which politicians look to those people to advise because they think that whatever is good for the big four accounting firms and their clients is going to be good for the country as a and for the citizens as a whole um, and I think the erosion of the civil service neutrality and independence has played a key part in undermining the, the, the process of good <clears throat> government in this country. So uh, that's another dimension, I think, and it's another form of corruption of democracy when you don't have an independent uh, civil service able to... Uh, uh, to, to look at laws from all sides and determine and advise on what is good for the country as a whole rather than good for powerful corporations. So we have, uh, I know we have quite a number of questions in the queue. We really have time, we've already gone over, but one more. Uh, so we'll take the recording off. The question was asking about um, the private public partnerships that we see. Uh, and whether, you know, and there is sort of the idea that they're supposed to uh, assist in anti-corruption and anti-tax evasion efforts to really be part of the solution. Uh, but the question is whether those private public partnerships uh, may actually be either creating a problem or part of the problem. Um, so I will turn it over um, to, to Prem and John. Well, I'm going to come and speak. Okay, well, maybe I'll go on, John, you have a go. No, good, good. No, you did, did Prem. What I was going to say, Donato, thanks for the question. It's, 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 it's something that I've, I've certainly been involved um, in a number of public, in looking at and advising on a number of PPPs. And, and you know what? Um, I, I've come to the conclusion, and I think I, I, I felt that right from the start a, a great deal of scepticism about them. But my conclusion is absolutely they, they are part of the problem, they are not part of the solution. There's a lack of accountability. I remember the first major partnership that I looked at, uh, it, you know, the contracting process ran to hundreds and hundreds of pages. And it's absolutely clear that at some stage when these things start to, 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 to roll out, there was gonna be massive lit litigation. Um, and that, in that particular case, proved to be exactly the case. Massive litigation ensued, and inevitably, the the private partner won because the contracts had been skewed in their interest. I think it's undermined accountability. It's undermined the requirement that our politicians actually make decisions and take responsibility. I feel very strongly that in the majority of the cases that I've looked at, they have neither delivered um, value for money, nor have they delivered on the promise that they would cut back on corruption. Well, th thank, thank you, John. Uh, it's a very interesting question. So thank you, Donato. 
question in a week when the, the Public Accounts Committee, which is the Committee of UK Parliament, published a report saying how the government spent £37 billion on test and trace, paying some private consultants up to £7,000 a day. And at the end, we can't, the government can't even show that any of that made any discernible difference to the UK's handling of the COVID pandemic. Uh, because lots of contract details were not published. We don't know much about it. We don't know where the money went. We don't even know if we got value for money. So there's all kind of issues raised about accountability uh, as well. We have a kind of a public-private partnership, partnership operating in many different ways. If you are to look at the board of HMRC, which is UK's tax, tax authority, you will find lots of individuals from uh, major corporations and accountancy firms over the years who sit on uh, that board, or at least have come from private organizations. And HMRC has not been very successful for dealing with tax avoidance by large companies. There are not many cases where they have actually taken any of these to the courts despite revelations by Panama Papers and Paradise Papers and Jersey Leaks and, and, and many others. Within HMRC, there is also something called a general anti-abuse uh, rule. So there is a panel called GAR panel. It is, all, it is almost entirely made up of individuals from law firms and accounting firms and corporations who actually either have defended tax avoidance or promoted uh, uh, tax, tax avoidance schemes. And again, none of, none of the GAR rulings relate to any large business. And you wonder why uh, th there is that kind of an issue. So, so that suggests public-private is very, very difficult. And uh, I agree with Joan that it is part of the problem. And you can see that at a bigger scale when we have, for example, something called a code of corporate governance, which is a voluntary thing. Now, you and I, even if we park on the wrong side of the road, well, we face the might of the law. And the general principle law of law is comply or else. But now we have a state within a state, which is for corporations. So we have no, no central enforcer of company law in the UK. There is no such regulator. But there is a voluntary compliance with this corporate code. And if you feel that you have any grievance, you can't really go to the courts and say, well, Your Honor, this uh, business has violated uh, something and damaged my rights. The first question would be, which law has been violated? Oh, there is no law. Is this a voluntary agreement? That does not really do anything. And the way the Corporate Governance Code was devised, uh, you would find hard push to find any line which says pay a decent wage, do not engage in bribery, do not engage in corruption, be transparent about tax avoidance, uh, don't exploit workers, all those things utterly taken out and marginalized. If anything, problems of corporate governance have been multiplied because this kind of a code and the government's acquiescence to that has actually emboldened corporations to commit criminal acts, knowing that there is no real, a real enforcement of any kind. So I think, uh, personally, I favor public model, but with the empowerment of stakeholders so that they have the power, they have the power to call misbehaving corporations to account. And at the moment, we don't really have that in the UK. All right. Um, I'm unfortunately, as I said, going to uh, have to close it off now. Um, but I would really like to thank our uh, three guests today, uh, Brandon Garrett, uh, Prem Sika and John Christensen. I know that I, and I'm sure all of the attendees have found this to be um, an immensely valuable discussion, a bit depressing, but immensely valuable. Um, so what I'd like to do now uh, is turn it over to Engin Erkin uh, for a summation to kind of really pull this all together. So as we leave, we kind of have it wrapped together in our head. Uh, on to you, Engin. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ring. Uh, as Professor Ring has already mentioned, 
My name is Engin Erken and I am a postgraduate researcher at the Center for Financial and Corporate Integrity at Coventry University. I am also a research associate on the Virtue project. Uh, I am undertaking a PhD with a primary focus on money laundering predicate crimes, including corruption and tax offenses. So this has been an extremely interesting and fascinating discussion for me. Firstly, I would like to thank to all of the fantastic panelists, Professor Garrett, Professor Sika, and Mr. Christiansen, who is the director and founder of the Global Tax Justice Network, which is one of our impact partners. Thanks also to our chair, Professor Ring, to Dr. Grasso, Dr. Pasculli, Dr. McLennan, and all the audience for attending this roundtable session. Today, we have focused on different forms of corruption, including traditional bribery and indirect corruption, along with more structural institutional issues that could be framed as conflict of interest situations relating to the state corporate nexus, lobbying practices in terms of under corporate influence on the political process and tax regulation, and the enforcement aspect of the phenomenon regarding tax prosecutions of corporations and backroom deals. Firstly, the panel discussed unfair competition practices between states and the role what corruption play and the role that corruption plays in relation to such national approach to taxation. If you look at the state corporate nexus, we can see that the relationship between them is not healthy, rather it's a corrupt environment. Professor Garrett raised competitive disadvantages between jurisdictions. Mr. Christensen stated that competitive advantage is a completely toxic nonsense and is all about promoting competition between states. He added that hosting a huge privileged financial sector only benefits a tiny minority and does not benefit the economy as a whole. He underlined the supply side of corrupt practices and emphasized the role of tax havens and enables. Professor Garrett mentioned that the states who operate tax havens also protect them politically. Professor Sika referred to the unhealthy connection between states and corporations as a systematic problem, as the authorities that we expe expect them to deal with it are also the ones who are part of it. He mentioned that it's a never-ending struggle to overcome and emphasized the role of education and the necessity for a revolution of the human consciousness to address the predicament. We also discussed lobbying issues and talked about how national tax policies are affected by the undue influence of and forceful pressure from wealthy corporations, resulting in an environment where aggressive tax avoidance practices are allowed. Professor Garrett stated that the annual tax gap in the United States is approximately $400 billion. Lobbying is a matter of conflict of interest, and in this sense, Mr. Christensen highlighted the necessity of reframing the concept of corruption. He stated that power shapes the corruption discourse, and considering the practices undertaken by enables and multinational enterprises, bribery was the dominant part of it. However, bribe taking constitutes a minuscule issue compared to tax evasion and tax avoidance. In other words, corrupt practices go beyond giving and taking bribes. Lastly, we discussed the difficulties relating to enforcement practices. The complexity of tax legislation, the lack of skills and competencies of the relevant authorities, and the unwillingness to prosecute big corporations resulting in affecting tackling mechanisms. Such corporations always look for agreement opportunities to resolve legal disputes on tax matters, and when there is an agreement, it is not transparent. Rather, it is in the form of backroom deals. Professor Garrett and Mr. Christiansen highlighted that this also involves revolving door relationships between the various parties, as in the case where high-level prosecutors become defenders of big firms. In this context, Professor Sika raised issues about transparency, openness, and how regulatory bodies are structured, reinforcement of which seem to be the best strategy for tackling the phenomenon efficiently. In the Q&A session, we covered extremely salient issues. There were so many fascinating questions, but due to the limited time at our disposal, I'll focus on a few of them. There was a question on state secrecy, and in particular, how a recent bill of the UK government 
namely the covered human intelligence source bill, may adversely affect taxation practices, considering it offers criminal immunity for certain parties. Professor Sika mentioned his concerns about the legal instrument by referring to it as a diverse kind of legislation. He added that if it becomes an act, nobody will be able to sue anybody due to the privileges it introduces. Another interesting question was on the effects of public-private partnerships and panelists emphasized, amongst others, the importance of transparency and accountability in this context. Once again, it was a fruitful and fascinating discussion and many thanks everyone for your contributions. Thank you. Uh, Engen, thank you very much for that summation. And I, uh, after today's discussion, I can see that there's uh, much work for you and your colleagues at the Center uh, for Financial Corruption uh, uh, and Cor Financial and Corporate Integrity. Um, so uh, that really brings us to the close of our four roundtables. Um, I would like to thank um, all of those who have been joining us for these sessions and, of course, uh, today's panel participants. We uh, very much appreciate your attention to these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.